Hi, uh, hi, Dylan. Hi. It's a, a huge pleasure to uh, to having here in, uh, into my blog. So maybe you can at the beginning uh, give like uh, some short introduction of yourself to to my uh, audience. Yeah, um, yeah, it's great to to uh, be uh, to be here. Um, I'm Dylan Richards. I'm a composer, performer, organizer. Uh, I'm from California. Now I live in Aarhus in Denmark, um, where I'm just finishing up a master's degree at the Royal Academy of Music here. And um, I'm part of uh, this ensemble Current Resonance too, organizing concerts, performing, and um, putting together some festivals here in Aarhus. Um, Dylan, um, from your uh, point of view, what is a good musical composition? Whoa, um, that is a, quite a big question. I think, uh, I can't boil this to, down to any one thing. I mean, the criteria for what I might feel personally is a good musical composition can come from so many different angles that may be highlighted in a particular work. Like it, for me, it could be more a, uh, the sensual experience of the work. It could be more to do with um, like its meta play and a kind of conversation in a community. Could have more to do with um, some kind of uh, social relevance as well, uh, or some like kind of combination of all of these. Uh, but I think, I guess maybe for if I try to take my taste out of it, uh, any work that kind of succeeds what it sets out to do, or that kind of maybe starts a conversation uh, or changes something, could be successful in a way, maybe. And maybe you can tell about a little bit about your uh, your music. What is um... I don't know, your signature, your uh, signature of your music, or the way. Sure, um, I'd like to think maybe I have more than one, but it, things are kind of always in a little bit of flux. Uh, but I think for a number of years, maybe a signature of some of my work was um, trying to use various contemporary behaviors uh, to outline the form of a work. Um, so I've used things like uh, the YouTube Up Next algorithm or uh, anthems that people have on their Tinder profiles as ways of structuring work. Um, and kind of uh, recently I've been trying to use certain uh, techniques that I've developed in the last handful of years working in multimedia pieces and tried to orient them towards like some purely sound work and see what uh, these previous multimedia techniques might yield in just like a oral domain. And maybe you can give some, some let's say, if you would need to choose one or two uh, pieces of you, right, which uh, maybe is the best describe your musical ideas, uh, which would be? Um, like a, a short uh, little uh, example of uh, like a, of my more like multimedia aesthetic and kind of hardline conceptual pieces would be um, my piece Up Next, the one that uses the YouTube recommendation algorithm. Uh, but it's also embedded in a larger work of mine now called Sampler, which should be out sometime in the near future uh, with documentation. So that, that's a great kind of summary, a sample, if you will, of uh, my work. And then a more recent example would be um, this piece, Self-Portrait in the City, which is kind of an evolving work uh, that's highlighting a little bit more of the sound focus end that I've been exploring lately. And um, what's your way of composing? How you start and how, how this process look like? Um, for me, the process almost always starts with a kind of general idea, a concept uh, that usually is ruminated over for quite a while first um, and like teased out how that might um, be approached from different angles and then uh, trying out different ways of realizing it. It can be really different depending on uh, the concept. Uh, yeah, sometimes it, it might be a lot more of um, a kind of algorithmic process where I kind of find the best material to put into a certain process uh, that like yields the piece and then most of the time is spent on finding the the best material to put into this to kind of yield a narrative that I'm excited about or want to communicate. Uh, other times it has a lot more of kind of play uh, and experimenting with different things in different software or uh, this piece self-portrait in the city that I mentioned has more of kind of a workshop uh, process with performers that changes the work over time. So it really is changing from piece to piece, but always germinates from a single idea at the start.
so it's like single idea and, and then you're just thinking how to how to how to sing how with a single idea how you can how you uh, can turn into some musical idea right yeah yeah I, I think i um i probably don't worry so much about the um the musicality of it uh i think i trust that that will come naturally just because of the byproducts of like who i am how the work we've presented who will be performing it or where it will be shown i think it kind of always gives it this music frame uh that's perceived in uh but just yeah just trying to figure out yeah a satisfying way of communicating or bungling this process uh, uh, <clears throat> now i have two questions from from composers uh -huh. first one is what you as a composer fears the most <laughs> or what is the your composer fear right yeah um, um... I mean, there's, I guess, especially right now, there's kind of a fear of maybe uh, maybe being forgotten or not being needed, right? Uh, I'm definitely not someone who just makes work for, for my own pleasure or for me. So I think the being part of a community and a kind of ongoing conversation is really important. And especially now when we're a little bit more distant, even if we're all online, uh, I think... Yeah, I think being forgotten or not needed, uh, especially because of kind of the fringe nature of the like European new music scene is always a, a concern and something that we have to constantly reflect back on to um, assess if you know, we're doing something that's valid or beneficial to the world. And uh, second uh, question from composers um, is, um... Why well, you still compose, right? Yeah, um, I think there's probably a couple of different layers to this, uh, or a few. One being that um, just on the personal level, it's still something that I get a lot of good out of, an uh, experience that even if I don't always enjoy in the fun way that I think is important for me as a person. Uh, another is like the kind of more local interpersonal level. Uh, that I, I think kind of the act of composing and putting on work and putting on other people's work has kind of become a great way of yeah, getting to know people and interacting with the world on the local level and building things on the community. Uh, and then on like the more global level, uh, just kind of being part of an ongoing conversation that might have, well, I don't know, we can't count on it having any real degree of posterity, but the kind of uh, sense of being part of a grander cause, I think, uh, and yeah, being part of a larger conversation is really important too. Looking back like 10 years, right? Uh, 10 years back, right? When you even start your composition, uh, maybe uh, compo the, first, the first step in, uh, in composition, how you change, right? What yeah, well, changes, what you like see like retrospectively. Uh -huh. um, 10 years ago, I didn't even identify as a composer. I mean, I was in high school, uh, I was playing in various hardcore bands in San Diego. I think I was probably maybe listening to a little Steve Reich. Uh, yeah, but I was, I was really into math rock and hardcore, playing bass. I had done like a MIDI score for a Shadow Puppet play. That was probably the only real thing I had kind of composed other than the hardcore albums I was working on. And uh, yeah, then I went to my bachelor's, kind of inadvertently discovered like 20th century European modernism, like Stravinsky and stuff. Uh, wrote that music, realized I could kind of study this thing called composing and uh, took off in this direction that led to me moving to Berlin and yeah, um, to work on the kind of music I was, this more multimedia, conceptually oriented uh, aesthetic. So it's been kind of like a, a wacky process, but probably not that unusual for someone uh, of my age from America. Yes. And like looking back, who was like the biggest triggers of, of change, right? So, Yeah, well, so like I said at the very beginning, probably uh, Steve Reich, I remember like different trains. I would have been listening to that maybe 10 years ago, but I wouldn't have thought about it as new music. I really would have thought about it as like math rock. Okay. I think it was, I mean, that, it was on an album with Pat Metheny as well. So it's really not like presented in that kind of way. Uh, 
Coming and, to Berlin? Coming to Berlin sometime? Yeah, yeah, that would be later. Yeah. And then my bachelor's, I got really into Stravinsky. That was very important. Um, I had a massive like phase where I was into kind of a lot of this, what I call like Faber core British contemporary music, like uh, Thomas Addis, but also Gerald Berry. And uh, yeah, then uh, yeah, I got really into a lot of the more like post 2008 Darmstadt stuff, like Johannes Kreidler, uh, Peter Oblinger, on um, just through the internet. Uh, kind of found out about some of these concerts live. Was kind of exhausting what everything I could watch on the internet and decided to go to Berlin. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was super important just to really see like a major scene in action and uh, kind of be spongy and go to too many concerts all the time. And how development of technology has influenced your music, right? So it's 10 years, it's still a significant period of time, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And my relationship to technology has changed a ton in it. Uh, like my whole introduction to kind of working with composition was either, you know, through guitars or in MIDI software at the start before I really even thought of it as like composing. Um, and then my, like my entryway into composing was actually composing guitar music that was too hard for me to play and notating it in some like free MIDI tablature software. So it was definitely software mediated and then uh, getting finale and kind of working into that and uh, just trying to pursue a more composition path in my bachelor's. Uh, but actually in my, most of my bachelor's, I was just working kind of with scores, still usually working with the computer a little bit, uh, but sometimes just working on the page and not uh, super technology oriented. I would kind of oscillate between more like kind of granular synthesis based acousmatic works and um, I tried a little bit of like, I did a piece that had a pure data patch I built for live processing with piano. But it, it wasn't really until the end of 2015 where I kind of started to work with this way less high tech, but much more kind of low tech uh, sample based. Like uh, this Google search piece, three pieces for Google search was the first one and then up next. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I was really working more in video editing software. Uh, it was kind of all coming up with an idea first and then working in video editing software and the ability to uh, traverse so much material on the internet and see the way the different things were interconnected. Uh, and then to be able to also download and uh, work with all this material uh, definitely became a huge paradigm shift for me. And how, how like your observations, uh, how, let's say, new music, they, how we compose, how co composers compose new music and landscape, how it's changed in the last 25 years, let's say, in this century, how it's changing, right? Yeah, yeah we're speaking like in general, like the, uh, so if we're talking about on a less specific basis um, and maybe more just trends, I guess, uh, we maybe saw like the culmination of a lot of the extended technique based practices, right? This kind of like, uh, all sounds possible, both in electronic and instrumental medium, uh, what some people call like the death of material progress. And then uh, maybe in line with that, this uh, increased in multimedia work or uh, so-called like relational music, music that's not just about how it sounds, but more about yes. using the material as a symbol. Um, yeah, so I think both of these things are massively trending especially like the more musical side what some people might call like uh expanded absolute music so just using uh multimedia like movement or video as more just um motivic like samples kind of uh not working with them in pretty traditional musical ways but just having an expanded uh base of material through different mediums i think that will probably yeah, continue to happen. And I also think in the last 25 years, especially in, if we're talking about this kind of more institutionalized European new music scene, you've seen uh, an awareness of like kind of diversity and how curation affects uh, narratives of like what is new or even if that's a useful narrative. And maybe uh, focus on kind of more different kinds of like uh, sonic subjectivities, like uh, certain kind of like sensitive and quiet music that might have been left out of uh, this like European festival circuit, like some of the yes. composers 
and people influenced by them, I think is recently starting to kind of pick up a lot more momentum in in the more institutionalized circuit. Uh, we saw things like Jörg Fry had a orchestra piece on Dona Schenge, uh this past year. And uh, do you see some picture or your, what would be your picture where these trends are heading? And let's say what, yeah, could, I mean, be, what could be a new music uh, see, scene or trend or main, main trends or in 2040, right? Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. Uh, I mean, there are so many, I think things are kind of going in all directions, right? So if I say one thing, it doesn't mean, yes, yes, I don't think it's, 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 you know, it's not also going kind of the opposite way. Uh, but I, I think if we're kind of looking at the long scale, like while we have this, um, you know, percolating of multimedia works and especially these uh, like big event oriented, large scale evening concerts, uh, I think like on the flip side, there'll be kind of a caution about that and people working on this hyper local, like for instance, the carbon footprint of concerts is something that's uh, started to be publicized or that will be like stated in the program somewhere or uh, the organizers will be very forthright about when they're doing certain kinds of organizing. And uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, awareness of the impact of what the concert uh, is doing to the world, right? Uh, I don't think we're going to be seeing the London Phil touring Asia all the time uh, in the future, right? Both because of like the global impact, but also like health concerns maybe in the short term. And I think, yeah, new music won't be immune from this either. I think we'll see things happening on a much more local level. Uh, both to kind of, uh, distribute the power in the community. So these kind of like major institutions and festivals don't have uh, total taste making control, but also uh, just for like more practical purposes, right? And um, yeah, I think there'll be a massive ethical dimension to concert going. I think even maybe before uh, too much uh, renewable energy takes hold, you could even see these kind of, I've heard people talking about like electronic free concerts, you know? Yes. No, no electricity at all, or even having like performers or audience members use uh, bicycles to power the concert, right? Yes. Um, so a, a massive awareness of, yeah, the politics that the concert is playing into maybe, uh, I think will be really big. And I think you'll see uh, additionally a lot of instrument building and people writing for really specific instruments. And uh, maybe that people will go towards the classical traditional instruments more if they want the symbol of that specific instrument and less because of uh, performers. Because I think that is more what drives kind of the instrumentation of the market today yes. is performers, right? Commissioning works because they are experts on this. And I think maybe everyone in 20 years might look a little bit more like a percussionist in new music who kind of does everything, right? They can like play a keyboard, they can bang things, they can bow things. Uh, and I think, yeah, you'll see kind of people who specialize as performers be much more multifaceted or be just a general wind player or um, someone like Weston Olenke, who's like a general kind of brass player, even though he specializes as a, as a trombonist and can also do a number of other performative and electronic tasks. Uh, yeah, so I think we'll see people being really broad, just being more performers. Yes. Uh, and I think because of that, composers will have more freedom in like each piece to yes. kind of redesign the instrument. And you'll have people specializing in these hyper-specific instruments too. Um, but I think, yeah, the more classical instrument thing will, will be for more specific uses, at least in music that I might think will be interesting. Yes. And then, of course, on the flip side, I think we'll have like a massive increase in electronic works and multimedia works and the the kind of large scale. Um, but I wonder if there will be a weird uh, scale tipping point where that kind of stuff becomes so typical and so expected and kind of seen as uh, indulgent. And especially these like whole concerts of one person, uh, which like, I mean, they can be great, but... Yeah, I think there's really going to be a, or I hope, a kind of, yeah, awakening of the space that things are taking up. I have a, a question regarding technology. Remember, just we talk about how technology shapes you, right? 
mm-hmm. how it shaped uh, how it shaped um, uh, all new music scene. But to to your mind or to your feeling, would be the most important? Let's say for next twenty years, which kind of technologies could be could be play the most important role in redefining mm. uh, uh, or recreating uh, new, new music? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to the concerts thing, well, it'll be interesting. There's, if we talk about, I think there's two dimensions here. The one of like putting on events yes. and the other of like uh, the composing of the work, right? I mean, of course, these things are pretty linked, but the, yeah, the realization and the performance uh, or the, the, the creation. Um, yeah, I think there'll probably be, you know, more realistic sample libraries or, you know, yeah, uh, more detailed ways of realizing acoustic sounds with technology. Probably, um, maybe that will also render the old instruments like less desirable, and like a rise of more self-designed ones. Um, yeah, probably a lot more like AI-based music. Like recently, I've seen a ton of channels come out that is all deep faked audio. Uh, that's pretty insane, powerful stuff. I think we'll see a ton of deep faked audio, a ton of uh, 3D sound uh like sound in vr um i think we'll see a ton of just like uh ai composers like if you imagine how spotify playlists are maybe like you would log into a spotify playlist but the spotify playlist is all personally generated music based on like all your data it's been collecting and the algorithm says oh this is the exact kind of like pop rock or like electro funk that you want and it's yeah, I, I and it's customized, that. right? And it's personalized because it's uh, it takes your inputs into, right? So it generates. Yeah, yeah. Your- well, it takes whatever data it has available from. Yes. Your- yeah, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm sure that will probably be happening. Maybe that's already happening. I don't know. Can you imagine, <laughs> let's say, in the next ten years, that uh, I will go and I will have a software and I will put. Okay, I would like to create like a twelve minute piece in the style of Simon. Could it be possible? Well, this is Harry Lehman talks about this. Uh, you, yeah. right? Harry right. Lehman talks about this in a paper from quite a while ago now. Uh, I think he brings it up like with uh, Zanakis or people like that, right? You know, um, the AI to just write a new Zanakis piece, uh, and, and someone like David Cope uh, in Santa Cruz, like a while back, uh, did it. I think the algorithm was called Emmy. It was like a Bach imitation software, and I think he's done this for like Messiaen and Chopin. Uh, they don't all sound right to me, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure that thing will exist. If if there's a market for uh, a Simon AI, uh, Simon Stein Anderson AI composer, sure. There's a, from Trio, there's already a Facebook gift for it, so maybe it'll happen. Yes. Yeah. And maybe uh, let's say next thing, right? So we just, we talk a lot about quite think, uh, how let's say, how content uh, is changed, right? How, uh, what technology is how we create musical content different, uh, how concerts are organized and how is it seen, but how, um, how you see how new music audience are changing, right? Yeah, well, this really depends on yeah, so many factors. Uh, I think maybe, I think the utopic desire for how the audience is, would change would be to have more diverse audience in terms of, you know, age, demographic, you know, uh, racial, demographic, gender, uh, people from different kind of cultural backgrounds and socioeconomic status. I think like, that's probably what a lot of us wish would be the case. Uh, and also, but I think, I think for that to happen, you need to be bringing those kind of creators into the process too. And, I think even just be bringing in new people in the first place, uh, like, you know, new music scene needs to be getting more eyeballs and outreach out there. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the institutions, I don't think care so much about that. Like uh, something like, you know, the Darmstadt Summerfest is is much more for the club. I mean, people travel from all over the world for it. And so it's not concerned with doing outreach to the people who live in the city of Darmstadt. Right. Uh, And, I think, yeah, maybe festivals start to change that. Like, uh, as things become more local is my guess. Uh, I think that will maybe happen. But uh, I think unless the kind of new music 
communities in different uh, cities and countries kind of have a, inhabit more of like an important social uh, role, then there's not a huge reason for people to come. Uh, so I don't know, I'm a little pessimistic about the audience. Uh, I, I think things have maybe been getting younger, but I'm young, so I don't really know what it was like. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, I think things might be increasing, but Mm, there's so much music out there, so much music coming out all the time that uh, I I really don't know. I think it could very well be the same size in 25 years or even uh, smaller. I have heard, right? I have heard some idea and some observation uh -huh. that the uh, audience are decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And then was one particular composer, uh, my friend, he has this, not vision, but let's say, prediction that at the one point, there will be no audience, and so there will be no role for new music, right? Because, because it, th there is no need for, uh, for some, uh, the government to support something or give grants, whereas there is no consumer at all, right? Mm. Do you see well, there is some danger there or, or not? Yeah, I mean, just because there's no present consumer doesn't mean there will never be consumers of it or people, you know? You know? Uh, if you think about a work like, um, not that there's no consumers of it, but like Trond Reinoldsen's Norwegian Opera, uh, or like, yeah, the Ooh series, that's all totally funded by grants that like ultimately come from the Norwegian government, I think. It has been for like a long number of years now. And those were just like videos that were going on YouTube like the for a while. They weren't ever having performances outside of this uh, house in like someplace in Sweden. And the videos don't have like a large number of views, right? But uh, the Norwegian government was still like giving him the money because whoever's like on the committees or boards that give out this money believe in the project, right? And think that it's an important thing to have out there. So, but of course, some of these countries are quite unique cases, right? In somewhere like America, this would be really not the case. Uh, yeah, and also maybe I think ideas of new music might be changing or like even using the term new music, I think some people don't like that. Uh, and I think, well, what I see happening with this kind of like new music outreach a lot of the time is bringing people from, uh, bringing artists from like other communities in, like uh, like in booking them on the festival. Uh, and And the idea is that then the new music festival is becoming more diverse. You're including more people in it and potentially bringing more audience members into yes. this community. But I'm not sure how effective that ultimately is uh, unless, like I think when it's kind of like this like one-off token performance, it probably is not near as effective as like a radical restructuring of the programming. Yes. And I think maybe some places like uh, Mare's Music in Berlin, for instance, has like taken on a much more uh, CTM festival influence in its programming and maybe it's working i haven't been like uh, the last time so yeah but i'm not super optimistic uh sadly um <clears throat> just talking about right uh, we talk uh, about audience and new music but what is the role right what is the role of new music in society why we because mostly in europe right yeah. we subsidize it by for our money right so yeah. the government government gives grants to Composer. Yeah, well, I think there's maybe different types of new music, right? That could fulfill different functions. I could totally imagine some sort of like more body-based, like transducer piece that has a role of like healing something. You could imagine a composer writing for some like ultrasonic vibrations that uh, that do some special massage, or maybe even try to target like uh, by the way, I can hear it, well. in the body or something, right? Uh, yeah, uh, and that could have like a very utilitarian purpose, yes. but also really interesting art. Uh, and then we could also have kind of more just like uh, work that sounds nice, right? I think whether or not we want to ca categorize that as new music right now, like we'll leave that aside. But I think I think there'll still definitely be a place for that. Uh, and I think um, at least like one of the modes I'm interested in is this kind of like uh, making connections, different kinds of connections, and um, where they maybe people are more open to perceiving these connections like in an artistic mode right and then i think it kind of ends up hopefully having the same function as something like contemporary art uh which 
you know, it's uh, charting maybe possible futures or um, flexing imaginations and, uh, you know, generally, uh, hopefully not overpopulation, but some degree of kind of creative culture uh, seems good for the populace or for um, a healthy last, society. <laughs> my last question for this interview, uh, Dylan, what would be your definition? What is uh, music of 21st century? Uh, in, in the way you use the term, right? Music that all, could only be made in the 21st century. Yes? yes, is that what you mean? Um, My definition, but you can redefine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because, of course, there was the easy way I could just say, oh, yeah. it's music that is written in the 21st century. Um, but if you're talking about, like, truly uh, new music, I mean, of course, there's this, this kind of angle of things that music that has not been done before or the, the more unmusical music, music that's not yet considered music, um, I think there's maybe also an angle of uh, music that kind of tries to reflect or embody like contemporary subjectivities. Um, like this is a lot more abstract and vague, but like, yeah, ways of feeling things, expressing things, uh, organize, ways of organizing time, right? Uh, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a little lost on. Uh... Oh, can you repeat the pet question again? I totally wrap myself up in that one. Uh... What would be your definition? What is? Yeah, of, of 21st century, century music. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um... Oh. I mean, yeah. The, the, uh, it's. I think. I find myself personally to be really attracted to extremes. And I find that when I make kind of one general statement on this, almost the opposite can be true. Yes. Uh, some people would say like 21st century music is like this ultra big music or big data or hyper informed music. But I think also kind of the extra small is very contemporary kind of like the finer details. Uh, I think uh, I, I heard a re really re great quotation recently. There was something about how you know, in the 80s and 90s, we thought the future dystopia was going to be kind of like these these robots, like Blade Runner, walking all around. But the, our future dystopia, dystopia is a lot more in like insidious and subtle, and it's kind of these things you don't see uh, that are tracking everything you do, right? Um, so I think maybe also the contemporary music it can also be, it doesn't have to be just kind of this big, obviously new things, but also a lot of uh, more subtle work. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah, attracted to a lot of this kind of what I call severe music right now that I see is really contemporary in a lot of ways. So that's a whole nother can of worms. Thank you very much for the interview. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Awesome.